All right. Okay. So, um, you know, thinking back and reflecting about your experiences, um, you've all um, led Socratic Dialogues, you've been participants in Socratic Dialogues. I'm really interested in your thoughts and reflections. How do you feel that this um, pedagogy has changed you or affected you as a learner? Um, it's not the traditional classroom. Do you feel you've changed as a learner as a result of learning in community or learning in dialogue? I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts. Definitely. It makes, I think it makes the traditional classroom <coughs> approach um, a little bit frustrating at times, um, you know, because you, like, I've ma it has made me have more of a desire to go deeper with things and to talk about um, things on a different level with other people rather than just sort of filling out a worksheet or something like that. Um, it, it's made me, it just made me want to get to that level with more of my studies. I, I agree. I agree with that quite a bit. Um, one thing I've noticed with this is that growing up and then getting to this point where I've kind of joined the Socrates Cafe a little bit and really started doing it is I'm, I'm no longer like scared or fear of mm -hmm. the work of going into a classroom giving just like a sheet of paper and then not talking to anybody about it and just solely relying on myself and with this idea I'm able to delve into something deeper I can go and talk with people I can understand it more fully and not be afraid to really delve into my education I'm not afraid in the back of the classroom worried about saying the wrong question or any of that like if I'm wrong but we're having an open down like conversation with everyone so like everyone can be wrong so I'm not like <laughs> like I feel yeah. pretty comfortable in the situation <laughs> of it all so <laughs> like that's something that I've definitely noticed about myself with this but yeah I don't think it's it hasn't changed me but rather I think reinforced um, my belief and and my approach to going about like in, about school and, and that I mean mm -hmm. um, you know, I think especially when it comes to learning uh, so much of it is a is a wager as as to the proper ways or the most beneficial ways of going about it and and you know as a testament I think Evan what you just said kind of reinforces like why you know this approach is is so validating um, in terms of making people feel more inclined to be a, be a part of the classroom environment um, and but it, you know, for me personally it's it, it's certainly it, I feel more inclined now to continue um, down with the Socratic um, you know idea tradition of and thinking of you know that, that idea that wisdom begins to wander and continuing to go yeah. and search for that it's made me a much better mm -hmm. listener because I'm the type of person who always assumes I know what people are going to say. Uh, but doing so many Socrates cafes with so many different groups of people has shown me that I rarely have any idea what's actually going on. And if mm. you just listen to the end of what someone's, you know, you have to let them work out the, <coughs> excuse me, the kinks for a while. But <coughs> once they get there, I find I'm more often surprised than not. And that was something that's changed, you know, my approach to a lot of my learning. I listen for longer and a little bit harder before I jump to conclusions. Mm -hmm. these, are these are really powerful comments. I mean, uh, as I'm listening as a teacher, um, th th I'm, I wouldn't have expected, um, but I wouldn't have expected that you would have said that, Evan or, or, or Nina. So that's powerful for me and it makes me think is how, how can I change my practice, you know, how could I continue to change my practice? Um, to reach the person who's quiet or to reach the person who's afraid to, to speak or that the person that might be talking all the time r really can learn more from listening. Um, and Griff, I know you've, you've spoken pretty strongly about this topic. It's, um, I think it's way easier to learn a lot more when you're presented with multiple different perspectives rather than like a single perspective as in the perspective of the creator of the material that you're being taught whether that be your teacher or someone else like it um it sheds more light on i don't know different perspectives I guess. yeah it's almost better to be presented with like rather than <coughs> being presented with an unbiased view to be presented mm. with several different biases mm. Mm. i think that makes a much more interesting and fuller experience and at least you know, more real world, especially when it's 
coming to something controversial. Exactly. Like that's I I completely agree with that. Like it's 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 I don't even know like how to put it in words, but my brain is just on fire about that. It's it's totally <laughs> true. Like I can't agree with you anymore. Um <laughs> like it just really is. Like you you the like the biasy about it is you see so many different point of views and so you're able to see the entire picture of it all. Like I feel like in certain classes you only see a sliver of it and you're told like this is what you do you have one way to do it let's do it with this you can come at it at so many angles and you get to see every angle and try every angle do what you're comfortable with and then you achieve it once you're happy with it like honestly like I've noticed that about it this style I'm a lot happier when I come to school like I'm like I used to come to school I did not like it but when I used to go yeah. to three democracies and this this entire kind of like learning style started rubbing off on me I really started to enjoy my my classroom and the environment and the people around me because people would see how I was different and so they would change themselves and I would have a better relationship with my teacher and the students beside me and it just made my day and my education a lot better a lot better so it's it's something it's it's amazing it's amazing it's wonderful I mean as we said you know this is an ancient idea. Mm -hmm. It's it's something that uh, it, it's it's a way of teaching and learning that's been going on for thousands and thousands of years. Um, so what we're hearkening back to to uh, a found really a foundation of inquiry. Um, I'm wondering what, uh, you know, looking back and thinking about your experiences in the classroom or when we're doing this, you know, in the larger community, what's, um, what if anything has been the hardest thing for you personally? Um, I mean, you were sharing maybe, you know, a little <coughs> bit about learning to listen, but have you, do you recollect moments in classes or in conversations or, because this is really like completely taking education and is like you're saying tipping it on its head right mm -hmm. um where i hear you guys saying evan what you're suggesting is we're all teachers we're all learners we're all coming together mm -hmm. the, the teacher is not the repository of information exactly you know and 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 the job of a student is not to just regurgitate exactly. and that's a heck of a lot harder mm -hmm. right i think that's way harder because you have to think I think my biggest challenge with this has been showing up on time. Literally, me too. Quite frankly, to this very day. <laughs> but you mean mentally or physically showing up on time? Kind of in the both, classroom? I'd say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just uh, I'm late for everything. So. I mean, for me, in the beginning, when I had three democracies with you, and um, the the hardest thing for me was really just getting comfortable with it because um, it's something that like this this entire learning style growing up for years with a certain way it's 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 such a change you could say and such an immediate like reaction and I remember sitting in class with Miss Busker and she's just like I'd always whisper her the answers and she's like why are you whispering to me like raise your hand like talk <laughs> with the class like <laughs> indulge and I was like I never wanted to do it because I never did that in any other class and so like when I first stepped in your class it was such an astonishment of how different it was from every single class I took and it's just I felt more engaged and it was crazy and that was that was probably the hardest part for me was just trying to get used to forcing myself to engage with everybody else. And I feel like once you get past that part about being comfortable with engaging yourself with everyone else in your class, it's such a breeze. <coughs> you enjoy it more, and then you just, it's its more enjoyable of a process of education once you can get pro like past that certain point. Wow, wow. I found like, I mean, just when thinking about challenges with this, it makes me think about some of our more challenging uh, like sessions, I guess. And I think those have come for me when, uh, you know, either when you haven't been there or when we haven't quite been able to clear up a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. And so two people or two or more people get really frustrated because they're not able to articulate exactly the idea because we're dealing with such enormous, difficult to grasp concepts that when you don't quite have the words for it and then someone is kind of getting heated and misunderstanding you and then two people are rising and emotions are just getting really uh, involved which you know is not a bad thing necessarily but 
uh, for me, it's difficult to, to step back and say like, okay, not a situation that you need to be angry about. Let's like calm down for a second and try and figure out what we're really trying to say. Uh, so that kind of, that balance between misunderstanding and then emotional difficulty was challenging for me. Yeah. That sounds a little bit like <coughs> interpersonal relationships. How, how has this affected um, your relationships with people in general? Because you now know this, this process. Well, I mean, specifically this group of people, the people who I've been involved in the most dialogues with, um, I've found that it, it provides you with an insight to the type of people that people are without, you know, necessarily even knowing. I guess that when you're saying things, when you're presenting your ideas, you really are showing a huge scope of who you are as a person. So on one hand, it's it's awesome because I've gotten to to get you know pretty close and intimate with the ideas of some of these people I'm working with. Uh, but then generally, just with interpersonal relationships overall. Um, it's definitely caused me to keep in mind that everybody has, you know, a whole lifetime of, of experiences that lead them to have a very specific perspective and that it doesn't necessarily uh, do anyone justice to just write it off immediately based on initial uh, I don't know, ways that you see people, I guess, can't think of the word right now. You look back your initial <clears throat> you look past your initial uh, concept of a person and try and imagine the type of things that they might be thinking about in the brain. Yeah, that's lovely. I mean, I, I mean, I can't imagine education being any different than this, but, you know, those are my blinders. Um, and... What do you mean by that? These are your blinders. Um, because this is just, for me, this is just a natural way of, of, of teaching and learning. It is delving into um, interesting questions or issues. And, and we're learning from each other. We're learning in community. To me, that's very powerful. I do think it's very, it's very non-traditional, which is ironic because it's the, mo it's the <laughs> most tr traditional, I think, in, in a way. <coughs> but... Um, when we think of trying to move public schools forward, um, redesigning teaching and, and, and learning, um, what do you? Th I just I would love your ideas. You know, everyone has ideas about how schools can become better, right? And how teachers can become more engaged. But do you see a place for for more of this dialogue in in classrooms? And um, when you think about if you could redo high school over again, not that you seniors would would, would want to do that, would <laughs> would you would you like to see more of this? And and if so, <laughs> um, how could we make that happen? You could wave your magic wands. I definitely like to see more of it. Um, ideally, in sort of different ways. I I don't know if I could imagine what those would be exactly, but to do it in the same way every time you know, in every class, not maybe not necessarily every day, but to sort of have, you know, the, the same um, style of discussion in several classes could get to be a bit boring, um, even though we would be talking about very different things. Um, I think it would need to be presented in different ways to engage different people. Um, and I also, in the sort of a similar vein, I think it's very uh, dangerous to get this mixed up with one of the sort of buzzes in education right now, which is teaching um, in a style that's very similar to facilitation. Um, and many of us who have had experiences in um, math classes <laughs> understand that that doesn't really work so well. Mm -mm. Um, no. So there really does need to be, I think, a balance of like m what we consider traditional learning. Like you do have to have a basis of facts and you do have to have a basis of like you know, concrete understanding before you can go on to this level, mm. um, which is, I don't know, just a personal caveat I would have to add to anybody wanting to do this. Yeah. I would also have to add, I mean, one thing that this really does very effectively is build respect generally because you really mm -hmm. can't, uh, mm -hmm. you can't do a Socrates Cafe if you're not on a baseline respecting everyone's uh, ideas, but I do worry a little bit um, about, you know, especially if you had a very abrupt change uh, about 
getting people to the mental space where everybody, regardless of what class they're in, regardless of what level class it is, or whether it's an honors class or, or AP or regular, mm -hmm. um, but that, that respect for the ideas of your peers, uh, regardless of who they are, is, is very daunting to me. I don't know. Yeah, building off of that, I feel like it's also really important that students feel respected by their teachers, because in classrooms where I've felt that I'm sort of being talked down to, I've felt way less comfortable expressing my ideas or asking questions because I don't feel that they respect me. Not that I don't think, you know, all the teachers are like, oh, I hate you, but <laughs> it's just, it's a lot harder to have that openness and that mindset and being able to bring something new to the table when you feel like mm -hmm. your teacher doesn't respect you. And it's very difficult once you feel that your teacher doesn't respect you to, uh, you know, break out of your shell a little bit and say things, which is, you know, speaking in class is kind of the only way you can earn respect from a teacher, so it's kind of a vicious cycle, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think going forward, too, though, and I think in my mind it's, it's a bit of a fallacy to, to think that in Socratic dialogue, um, answers aren't, we're not driving for answers. And, that, you know, it's often said that um, there is no right or wrong answer to, to, to an end or a concludable point. And um, I personally struggle with that because I, I think, you know, throughout the ages, in some aspects, I think maybe it's fair to say that philosophers have, you know, they've interpreted the world, but they failed in trying to change it. And that's the duty going forward. It's not enough mm -hmm. to merely interpret the world, but it, you know you need to come to agreeable points or and have dialogues to to kind of sort out you know the best of two ideas or multiple ideas and move. I think that's how progress happens. Um, that's not that's not to say that you know things need to happen in in in, in a debate. Um, dialogue is different in debate. And I think you can reach a conclusion through a dialogue. Um, but I mean again, barring from you know. But, John Stuart Mill's idea that's not enough to, to be right, but also knowing why you're right. I, I ardently believe in that. And mm -hmm. so I think, mm -hmm. it, and dialogue supports that notion because you're, you're, trying to, you're trying to dig deeper into a matter. So you're not necessarily digging deeper and then leaving the, leaving the table confused, but it is useful to get to the, you know, wh what you deem to be the correct answer going forward. Do you, can, can I ask, can I ask you a, a, a deeper question coming off of that? Do you, do you find that, um, after having grappled with questions in in deep and confusing dialogue, that that's um, that energizes you more to the action step or more to that next step than sitting and learning passively. Yeah, definitely. I think um, there's, there's been some dialogues where I certainly left a bit more unsure with my convictions. There's also been dialogues where I left absolutely positive, uh, not so positive, but, but reassured of, of my original position. And that's led me to, to action. And um, yeah, so I mean, it, definitely, I, I think, I think in, in grappling with tough ideas with others, um, at least personally, I feel inclined to get to get to the bottom of it and not leave it as an open-ended mm -hmm. end book. So, well, can, so can, can we pick on Cole for a little bit? Okay. Yes. So we can edit anything out. <laughs> no. But because um, I just want to pick up, cause I remember you said that this was really powerful for me, and I don't know if you remember. Um, oh, sorry. yeah, those are organic blueberries. Um, I remember you said right before the first one when when you were going to be facilitator, you said I felt I I feel a little uncomfortable doing this. Remember, and you weren't sure that you wanted to facilitate, mm -hmm. and then you did. And I said, how did that go? And, and, and we were debriefing it. And, you, and Riven, I think you were there in the class when we were. This was this past fall, right? I was there. Yeah. Not that um, you needed to know that. And saying that, that you were struggling with uh, wanting to guide the conversation <coughs> towards a certain outcome, but then holding back and not mm -hmm. doing that. And there was that creative, that, that was a little bit of um, creative tension for you. Uh, am I right? Do you remember that? Yeah, no, I do. It, and I, s I still struggle with it. It's not so much, I wasn't uncomfortable to be a facilitator, but I was uncomfortable with the idea of, um, you know, I, I think I've sort of, I've reached a point of introspection where I realize that in, in some areas I'm, you know, I, I believe in 
soft universal truths. You know, I'm not a fundamentalist in any way, but I, I think it's our responsibility to determine what's right and wrong, and not to just you know let things go. And so, mm-hmm. in, in, in mm-hmm. a dialogue, which I completely understand the rationale, sometimes um, you know when the when the consensus thought is, uh, how can we really know? Like, you know, so what? Which sometimes it goes there, sometimes. And it, I just really struggle with not, you know, taking over and saying, like, how, you know, with, with a bit of rational thought, you know? It, it, you, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, I th- there is a correct or, or more appropriate answer to, to a matter. Well, I think that's where, as you were starting to say, Nina, too, you were alluding to this, that's where the richness and the tension and the confusion uh, comes from when you have these sorts of discussions because you, you, you feel those edges um, of confusion or discomfort or disagreement, but uh, continuing to do that with respect. And it's very humbling. I mean, I don't have you guys felt that this work is humbling? Yes. Like yeah. when you're in oh these conversations God. with people and. People disagree with you, or you're forced to. Have you? You're smiling. I, I don't know. You haven't said anything yet, but did, have you found that this has been a hum, kind of a humbling experience? Sometimes humbling can be good. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. A lot of the times, I, I'll walk in with like an opinion about something, and then someone else will say something, and I'll just it's something I wouldn't even have considered thinking about, just because it never came up, and. I'll just think about it for a while and listen to what everyone says and in the end I definitely don't come out with the same conclusion. I don't think I've ever come out with the same exact conclusion that I, you know, the idea that I came in with because everything that every like each person says just influences like the idea that I have and it ends up becoming more rounded and I think it's definitely a humbling experience and I don't really know how to explain it but you definitely come out of there feeling, I don't know, new. <laughs> I agree. I think it's a very different experience, though, when you're facilitating versus when you're participating in a Socratic dialogue. Because, I don't know, I definitely prefer participating to facilitating because, you know, like a lot like Cole, I, I get really eager to jump in and share my ideas. And it's like, no, you're here to help other people, you know, flesh out their ideas and explain more fully their position or to consider other people's positions, but I still think that either way you're exposed to these amazing possibilities that you may never have considered before and that's definitely really humbling and also I think it's hard to, I guess, helpful in honing your like critical thinking and listening skills. Are we still on the topic of things that we that we started with? (laughs) Yeah, see, I was thinking the same thing. It's just building up. Because I I was going to say, um, I was going to say one, I don't don't necessarily struggle with it, but like going forward, and and I were having a conversation recently about this, about how, you know, it's it's almost like a a bit of a taboo in in school to associate politics with Socratic dialogue because, because you know, it can so easily turn into a debate and that's counterproductive. But, you know, inherently, politics is involved in Socratic dialogue because if we're talking about timeless questions, then there's nothing more timely than, you know, politics affecting what's going to be the, the actions taken against climate change or mm-hmm. inequality. So, mm-hmm. it, and I think it's important going forward in um, really honing in and sort of mastering the teaching of facilitation and how to be a mindful um, participant in a dialogue so that you, you can address politics or other things without mm. without it dissolving into, into a debate, right? Yeah. And I think going, because and I, I think not to, you said this before. I absolutely agree with you that you know I do think going forward the the nature of democracy depends on on these sort of dialogues, not debates, not conversations. And to to differentiate, I think a dialogue because it's deliberative, it goes deeper than just the surface value of a conversation because um, people are working together to go deeper. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I mean when yeah I don't know it, I can keep going on, but I, I definitely do think that though. The, Longevity. It's 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 not hyperbole to say the longevity and the prosperity of democracy and community going forward depends on on this form of dialogue. Mm-hmm. What have you learned yeah, about yourself from that process? What you came in, learned this thing. Now, what do you know about <coughs> yourself because of it? Um, I, it, it's tough for me because I've I've always been really 
interested in, in philosophy and everything. And so, I, although I've never participated in a Socratic dialogue before I mean Kathy, I was, you know, I was familiar with that line of thinking. I was familiar with other philosophical schools of thought. And so, again, like, I, in, in, no mean, in no means do I mean to sound, uh, you know, conceited in saying, but, like, it, it really just re reinforced mm -hmm. the convictions I already had coming in that, um, philosophy is still really prevalent today, like needs to be prevalent rather, and it, it and ancient thinkers are still very relevant. And so, there, a lot of the, I think a lot of the change I go through, for me, happens more personally, like uh, in my own self-reflection, and undoubtedly that's influenced by conversations with others. But it, more more than change, it's just reinforced values I already had coming into it. And um, that was really beautifully said. Thank you what you just shared in your comment about democracy and um, I, I just want to um, you know I mean I, I said to Howard I could talk forever about this I mean so we're gonna put the brakes on it in a, in a little bit but uh, two two things um, Nina I think when you had this idea you know to bring this to, uh, to, to open up this dialogue and to start them on a weekly basis part of what um, Maybe you didn't say, but what was implied in your earlier comments is this idea of um, student voices being heard, learning to operate with tolerance and respect for the idea. Tolerance and respect for the idea and the conversation, which leads to tolerance and respect for each other. Mm -hmm. um, which is a, a powerful component of this work. And I've seen all of you guys grow. I have seen all of you guys grow and change in, in, in ways that um, maybe you don't see. But because I think the nature of this worth work, because it causes one to be uncomfortable and because it's about listening as much as talking, encourages us to grow in ways that we don't often, we're not always challenged in those ways in school. Can you elaborate on that? Because going off what I just said, I'd want to know. From, from well, from I've seen you. Be I have seen you become more. Um, I think I've seen you become a better listener. I think I've seen you become more um, tolerant with hearing other views and, and, and engaging in deep conversations, even though you may not personally agree. Um, and I think I've seen you question. Uh, I've seen you question your your views, um, if only to reaffirm them or to revise them. So I could go on and on about this too. But are those um, I, I I I've seen growth in each of you guys. Um, Griff, I would love you if you feel comfortable talking about like you had had some really powerful testimonials earlier like when we were together in class talking about um, some as, as a student who was not always feeling engaged in school feeling that the that the, the system wasn't serving you and yet you when when you you're really good at this all right I, I I've seen you, I had you last year in class, remember, um, as a junior, and I saw one type of person. And then I saw you this year in class, and you, you just like, you took a bite of the apple. And you just became on fire, a different person. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. I, I don't know, I think it helps to like, provide students with material that's engaging and not hold every student to the same standard because what I, what I see happening a lot is like a, it's just kind of a it's a, like a machine that like processes each student in the same way which is not like that's not productive because like everybody's you know, everybody's unique, everybody's different, so, and everybody learns in a slightly different way. So I think it's just important to have, like, more than one outlet to explore, like, 
what you want to learn and what you want to pursue, and more than one way to go about it, you know, getting that information and like, and like, I don't know, discussing it, I guess. Mm -hmm. What did you mean when you said like not holding everyone to the same standards? That uh, just kind of confused me. Maybe not everyone's held to the same exact standards, but it's there's a very like pattern based like process like each student like they have like different options for different classes but they're very limited May maybe not here as much as in other public schools that um, but like it just seems like students are subjected to a lot like many students um, who may have like different ways of like learning and processing information are subjected to the same like process mm -hmm. like oh you sit in a desk here with all your, your classmates and you're given a worksheet and, and you know and it's like you know, oh your teacher writes something on the chalkboard you write it down in your notebook like and it's just that over and over again that's not an engaging process for many and it's not all like very like you can learn the information recite it but it's not going to stick like three years later when you're asked what you learned in that like intro to economics class like if you didn't pursue economics as like a career you're not going to remember <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. what is the mitochondria idea? Yeah. i have no idea it's a powerhouse of the cell yeah what but what does it do <laughs> <laughs> oh, i don't know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would like to add yeah. to what you said um because I think it's important, again, to have a balance because I personally am someone who really, really likes book learning. And I know I think, I, I think I'm a minority, um, but I, I would really hate to see um, that completely gone for people who do like it. And I think there, the importance here is to have opportunities for everyone to try out learning in different ways and to explore um, the same subject in different ways because that's what really makes learning interesting and dynamic and stick. Yeah, I'm not it, saying we completely yeah. eradicate like the, the no whole, this whole them all. like yeah <laughs> this this whole like, learning process. I'm saying like there are a lot of students that aren't like you that you know don't like they can't just sit and like read a book or, like write down some notes and then learn that information. But yeah. I'm saying we should cater to every, like I don't want to say like cater to everyone's needs as if everyone's entitled to like. Mm. That, that but I, I think that we should try to help everyone to achieve mm. like their goals. Do you, do you feel that this is a pedagogy that has that um, has engaged you more deeply? Yeah. Than in some of than that used in some of your other classes. Yeah, I like discussion rather than like just being talked at, having to like write it down. Yeah. Like, you know, like watch presentation or like whatever. Doing this kind of work definitely shows you that, like, within reason, any topic can be, you know, explored, shall we say, uh, through this method. But it definitely, you know, regardless of what you're speaking about, <coughs> you're working on the same kind of, like, critical skills. You're working on, like, learning how to concisely phrase your thoughts. You're learning listening. You're learning, you know, constructive thinking. Uh, but it definitely is, is important to me as well that every student is given the opportunity to explore a lot of different branches of learning styles. This is a really important one, but I think it's really important as well to explore your own ability within book learning because that's what ultimately rounds you the most as a thinker and a learner is to be able to stretch your mind in as many ways as possible. Mm -hmm. But I certainly feel that due to the nature of these discussions with so many different perspectives and so many different topics on the table, uh, and so many different potential ways that every topic can grow, uh, I always feel like more areas of my brain are kind of being stimulated because I'm trying to, I don't know, you're just constantly trying to figure stuff out and you're the, the entire time you're doing it, you're just trying to figure out various different things that people are saying and like how you're reacting to that and you know, whether you actually have something to say or whether you're just starting to think you have something to say and really you have no idea what you're talking about, so. And it's not so it's much wonderful. that like, I'm like really bad at like book learning because I can sit down and like <laughs> like I can't Do tell you how many hours I've sat on like Wikipedia reading about like the history of Pink Floyd and like a bunch of stuff that like it's is important. that I, it is important. It's very important. Um, <laughs> it is important. Um, it's important to know the difference between David Gilmore's voice and Roger Waters too. But that's 
Um, and like, like I can sit there and like I can read and take in information, but it has to be information that I want to learn. So like, and a lot of the classes here that I had to take weren't really like what I wanted to learn, even though like it is important to have like that basic general like knowledge to go off of. Like, do you feel mm -hmm. like though, if more of those classes were breached in in this kind of a um, a format, you would maybe, uh, I don't know, be able to find something in every subject to kind of cling on to, to be like, all right, well, that actually does that particular aspect of this I could speak to and kind of interest me. Yeah. You know, do you feel like, because I, I, that's how I feel, is that even if I hate math, I have come <laughs> out of, I, let me tell you, I've come out of high school with zero math skills. I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, but there are still aspects of it that are really interesting. Um, but they don't really, they don't catch you when it's just in passing, like, okay, well, yeah, it came up on t page 256, but, like, I don't really care still. But if it came up in conversation, you can speak to it. You can say, like, hey, well, I have this idea about that, and then that gets kind of, that gets a ball rolling, and you can talk about that aspect of it so that individually, if you have an idea that's interesting to you, you, you have the opportunity to expand on it, whereas sometimes in the classroom, like, you don't even know you want to ask a question about something because it's just in passing and you like just don't care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think another reason why it's so important to have um, Socratic dialogue as an option in the classroom is it because it reinforces or even gives students the idea that their voices and their opinions matter because a lot of the time if you're just regurgitating information you know you don't even really feel like a person because you're not <laughs> You're not questioning anything. You're not creating partnerships. You're not really thinking that much. So I think that this is really important because it gives people confidence in themselves and in their opinions and ideas and their positions. And I think it helps students become better learners. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Something really. I just I, I was going to say something. <laughs> we can about stop there, but you <laughs> could, could say one more thing. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say one more thing because I just really started thinking about that, and I just the idea of just sitting in a classroom and being called upon and so Evan what's the answer you say it wrong next person like what like you kind of <laughs> like you, you left me here bro like what are you doing like I'm wrong so teach me the right way like don't just ask me for the answer tell me I'm wrong move on and hope some other kid gets to like the correct answer like and praise them when they and yeah them and then when they do be like got it bro like move like right on and then you move what on to like okay if anyone had straws like you'd understand <laughs> <laughs> but Check it's, it just, out. Up. <laughs> it's the idea of just I, it's I don't like it because it's, it's such a fast pace. You move on so quick on certain subjects. Like I'll sit in a class, we'll learn it really quick, and then the next day I come in, I'm like, new piece of paper, new subject title. I'm like, wait, like I'm still so confused on yesterday. Like why, like why are we moving on yet? Like you didn't even ask me if I was comfortable with where I am in my education. Mm -hmm. So it pushed me to where I have to go get a lot of extra help outside of classes. And I honestly think it's, it's, it's a good thing to do when you need to know your education, but it also is, in my opinion, it, it's bothersome. It gets in your way of your education at the same time, because I feel like your education needs to be right there in your classroom, delved with everybody else, and delved in with your teacher. Not sometimes in this classroom, sometimes in a separate room at the end of the day, like, and then do it at home, or try to learn it on your own, like, you'll figure it out. It's like, I want to delve into it. Like, I really want to learn about my education, and I think that just needs to happen more. It's a struggle, and it's, there's that balance, which is really hard to find, but I think that's it's a big part that I think needs to happen. Are we super out of time? No, we're not out of time, no. but yeah. but I want to be sensitive to time. Yeah. Oh, well, um, I know you had something to say, but I also have something, but you can go first. Yeah, go ahead. That's okay. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I was just going to say one thing that did strike me uh, that I actually have never thought about in terms of this before, but pacing is uh, really unique in Socratic dialogues because even though every question, every day, you know, we walk in with a different question, each one has the same weight because we're giving it the same amount of time, we're investing the same amount of time. Uh, but the pacing of each dialogue is left completely to the group, whereas there are some points where it's like, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it for a little bit and then we're like, okay, yeah, we, we got this one. Like, we're going around in circles, let's move on. Uh, and then there are other aspects of it sometimes, you know, you'll get on on a specific tangent that you just can't get off of because everyone keeps adding these insane things and you're just like, okay, well that comment just totally changed my perspective and now I have to 
totally re envision what I'm talking about. <laughs> now I have to say another thing, and I still have no idea what I'm talking about, basically. Um, but that that pacing is really important to me because I always feel so. It's like okay, if there's one aspect of something that I'm really grappling with, and the group as a whole is really grappling with it, you have the opportunity to talk about that. You know, until naturally within the conversation, you move away from it. Sometimes that mm -hmm. doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we run ourselves mm -hmm. in the ground, and you have to, with a skilled facilitator, hopefully that won't happen. <laughs> but unfortunately, sometimes we've been left to our own devices and found ourselves in a bit of a rut. Uh, but yeah, so y you are highly skilled. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes you just quick. leave it to Wimble. Please, <laughs> <laughs> please. Um, I don't, I don't know. Like, in in listening to what a lot of people have to say, um, I. I would be hesitant, like in the future, to sit because I think a lot of people have to so you know exploring different pathways and um, you know no right and wrong answer, but working through it. I think a lot of educators right now would say, "Oh, like great, like we're doing that. That's proficiency based learning. That's multiple pathways." And it, it, certainly, there's many aspects of Socratic dialogue that are compatible with the movement education. That's that's a given. But and I, and I don't know how to. You know, I'm not quite. I'm not sure yet. Maybe where to differentiate. I'll just be hesitant going forward to, um, you know, especially at Harwood, and in having a movement such as this be sort of just consumed by what's conceived as multiple pathways and person-based learning mm. is sort of and sort of being squashed a, a bit because there might be something that's there, there undoubtedly are, but I can't you know I can't think of them right now. But there's probably something unique to Socratic dialogue that is is not being accommodated for in person-based learning or multiple pathways and all that. So you know. Uh, I see, yeah. Olivia. You're not. You guys are nodding your heads on that. <laughs> kind of thing. How to? Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely. Can't put my finger on it either. But I know. There's a real danger of conflation. Totally. With that. I don't know how to like really put it in towards, but something about like principles. I guess like there's something that's very virtuous, at least to me, in Socratic dialogue and working towards greater understanding, and that a lot of that just like pure philosophical inquiry and like virtuous questioning of learning yeah all that um is like missing from the multiple pathways type of thing because that's just a structure that can be compatible with it but it's not i don't know that just seems kind of like empty to me like those are just like acronyms or names right. for a, something that we're gonna well we're not we're out here but then yeah, good luck kaya is going to be put through and um <laughs> yeah but yeah i just feel like those are empty and socratic dialogue is much more meaningful what I mean maybe I'm oversimplifying I definitely am oversimplifying. no please do <laughs> um for me I think it just has to do with the community like it has to do with the fact that within Socratic dialogue and I definitely agree with cool I think there are right and wrong an answers about a lot of things and sometimes that can get kind of lost in the shuffle and we get to points where we're like that okay but that's wrong so maybe let's move on <laughs> um <laughs> sorry uh, but it's for me the community, like multiple pathways, proficiency-based learning, that's awesome for the individual. I mean, I think that is really important because I, I don't think grade-based learning is is particularly effective. Uh, but Socratic dialogue overall, and we talked about this, like what, 10 people, 11 ideas, like it's all about coming to, coming to the end, you know, whenever the end of the discussion is, and, and looking at the progress of the discussion, and then reflecting as a group, and then reflecting individually, and like you're responsible for your own individual growth over long term, but I just don't think you can get that same, you know, level, yeah, level social interaction, yeah, um, within any other any other form of learning. And I can only mm -hmm. hope, I guess, that this becomes a staple in proficiency proficiency based learning, so that it it is a tool that can be used to really you know, make that the most effective it possibly could be, because I think right now we're kind of stumbling into it with our eyes closed and our hands tied behind our backs, is what it seems like from my perspective, but. When you're in the cave. Yeah. We're Ooh. Well, but y you guys have started, you know, uh, um, you guys have started, you started this change, right? Um, and, and you inspired me, and if I've inspired you, that's all part of this community. I think that's really important. I'm that's a powerful thought. That's that is one of these very deep virtues of this sort of work, right? And it is work. Yeah, you have to think. Um, it's okay. <laughs> but but that is um, that's our challenge, I think. Mm -hmm. it, it is is to keep thinking 
not only for thought, not for school, but for life. How is the thinking different in Socratic Cafe versus the thinking in a, in a normal class? It's, okay, it's <laughs> super exciting because <laughs> <laughs> this is what I was wanting to say earlier, is that when you're in um, a dialogue like we have, you're making all of these connections with all these different things and people bring different things to the table like TED Talks they've watched, things mm. they learned in physics, like the amount of times physics comes up in philosophical discussions yes, <laughs> makes me wish that I had tried harder in physics. Like it's very <laughs> inspirational when it comes to um, learning different things mm. and like, I, like you look up to people who are able to bring a lot more to the table in terms of you know, things that they know. Um, Relevant because the, the only the only have. way we get anywhere with questions we can't answer is by looking at the questions we can answer. Nice. So, I mean, I, I find it really, really cool. Like, that, just the feeling of making a connection from one subject to another, that interdisciplinary approach is something really lacking in school that, mm -hmm. so like, a Socratic discussion um, mm -hmm. can help to bring back which, you know, considering our brain chemistry and the fact that so much of what we do is just connections and pathways yeah. and patterns, it's a little bit yeah. ironic that, like, it's yeah. not yeah. more what we're doing. But there is something very different about, and I was saying before, like, your brain just feels different. You're like, oh, yes, no, yes, I like this. This is good. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm all about this right now. Yeah. I think a lot of the times in traditional classrooms, too, just developed a lisp, um, I think, at least for me and Anna, I know, we are good at memorization. Mm of a lot of stuff but for me like that's what okay sorry um <laughs> like <laughs> in the traditional classroom it's just like memorizing facts or you know a declensions chart or Pythagorean <laughs> theorem just one. to name a few <laughs> but it's a lot less engaging and it's a lot less work mm -hmm. but I mean I, I, okay um, <laughs> <laughs> a lot less, a lot less work. What's 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 not? I don't think that's a good way to say it. Okay, um, personally, it's when when <laughs> you you guys did great. Like you you had full of excitement, like excitement when you said it, and I couldn't have any more excitement than you, Anna. Um, but um, <laughs> it's there is work to this. It's mm. it's it is so much work. Like I, my brain leaves so strained and so tired, but it's fun. It's worth it. You're on the same level as everybody else. You're all your brains and everyone is connecting the same way. You're all enjoying it. And then when you go to a different class where no one is like, they didn't just come for where you just came. And then you get into a classroom where everyone's just by themselves in their own little like math world or English <laughs> world or like whatever right. class you're in. Like you feel separate from everybody. And so you're back to yourself thinking by yourself alone. Like it's just when you enter an environment in a classroom where everybody wants to learn together and wants to hear what you have to say and wants to open up their minds you just it's a it's so much happier and it's way better can i just oh. clarify that i meant that memorization was less work okay. not that okay yes yeah, i forgot about, you're talking, less about work. Your, I forgot you're talking about your memorization <laughs> but to, to be fair though like I, I think there's a qualifier to what evan said in that it, when when you've been a part of a um if, if you've been in a group with a skillful facilitator, then it's and and with participants who are kind of have a feel for how things ideally will go, mm -hmm. then then it's work. But but to be fair, there certainly are. You know, if if you're in a setting, a dialogue can quickly become, you know, just reactionary. Yeah. You know, and so in, in that way, it, sometimes you, you can you can get in a situation where it doesn't require a lot of thought because you're just responding what comes off the top of your mind, and you're not really there's not a lot of introspection and everything. So it, it does take deliberation to reach a level of hard work mm -hmm. or, and mm -hmm. intellectual inquiry. So it's yeah, it takes a very specific intention, I would say, to, to make it work and to want to make it work. And that that's definitely the difference I've seen between specific groups in the community's dialogue. Some are, have a better feel for it than others. Um, but the one thing I did want to say is that I think the nature of them, no matter what, is if not work, at least just enough social pressure <laughs> that you feel that you are kind of at an obligation to be thinking quickly like and following what's happening it's very you huh. can't really huh. zone out because if you zone out suddenly you're like miles from <laughs> where you were before and you're like oh god i have nothing to contribute never i feel like everyone's looking at me because i have nothing to say right now and i have said nothing for 10 minutes 
Um, but I think just, you know, the, the way that we are as human beings and, and especially teenagers and uh, we're used to kind of being asked to respond to things. So sometimes it's okay to sit back for almost an entire one and not say anything. But I would say, at least for me, you're, you still have to be right there with the group and you still feel a pressure because of the, the momentum of the group to stay with it. And that's a lot of work. And it's a lot mm -hmm. of active listening and it's a lot of really focused, you know, time, energy spent on just like mm -hmm. being as present as you possibly can. And if you're not doing that, then you're totally wasting your time. So you just have to make sure, I guess, that um, that's the difference between when it's not work and it is work, I guess, when you I want it to be. I'm going to ask one more, and that is how early you guys have kind of gone through this through high school. Do you see this as something you could apply in middle school or even younger? Oh my God. Could you start this? Please make middle schoolers do it. I mean, that would I, solve a lot of problems. I personally, I personally feel, um, I actually remember um, a Socratic dialogue that I facilitated this spring um, with Casp um, Kathy's family it was in my group actually, and it was probably the best one I ever had. And so we, um, there was a point where, and I also mentioned it during that meeting up in Randolph, um, is I, I like to compare the styles of education and learning from when we're kids to when we become adulthood and so on and so forth and how it changes so drastically. Um, I think that if, if there's a kid in elementary school, I feel like classrooms there, they're a little bit more, they're, they're more open. I feel like you still have more dialogue because I feel like as a kid, you still have kind of like that innocence and the idea of interacting with other humans like we want to. I mean, we're, we're curious creatures. Like, it's what we want to do. We yeah. want to learn, we want to delve, we want to interact. With other people, yeah. With other definitely. people right beside you learning the same thing. And when you get older, you get walls that start to move in closer and bigger words and bigger numbers and fewer people wanting to like interact because you're all having to solely learn by yourself on a separate piece of paper right in front of you because i remember growing up in kindergarten first grade and second grade and doing projects with like half the classroom and all the kids and we were all like hey like let's do this we'd figure this math problem out like that and we'd all have a blast doing it and then as you get older it comes smaller and smaller and smaller until it's just you and I, I personally i personally do not like that so i like to interact with humans with my education and i think that's a very very big thing to kind of realize about all this um, is just how education itself changes as you change so yeah I would say it, sorry. No, it's okay. um, it kind of brings up the whole question of equity again because I think that no matter what age you are in this kind of having this platform of Socratic dialogue any age can be a valuable contributor to the conversation and can contribute valuable ideas so I think it should be something that's part of the classroom throughout school Certainly. once we enter school even if it's modified for different age groups I still think that the essential principles and you know guiding factors should still be there for whatever age yeah I was gonna say I think they're the most effective when you have the widest age age range just because I think they're the most effective when you have uh, as many diverse perspectives as possible uh, but I think they would be an incredible tool to use uh, throughout early education, <coughs> provided you had a facilitator who had a very strong grasp on child psychology uh, <laughs> in particular age groups because, you know, you're, you're going to have some kids at young ages who show some tendencies that you're going to want to shut down pretty freaking quickly, <laughs> so. Um, no speakers. No, well, yeah, those are the ones we're working for, Olivia. That's what we're looking out for. It's like the most important issue. <laughs> those are, yeah, those are the ones who grow up into people, so. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, in the, in the end, yes, I think you should use them in classrooms, and I think uh, I would have loved to do them in elementary school, like, elementary school-wide, like, a bunch of different yeah. ages of people. That would be really, really, really Did cool. Did you, who came with me to Faceton? Any of you guys come to Faceton this spring? Did you do that? No, we okay. did that this spring. We yeah. we we, ended it. we we took the <laughs> philosophy class, and we did a <laughs> cafe at Faceton Elementary School. Oh, with the kids? <sighs> with the elementary school kids. How I mean, we've done I from time like to time we do so that. Cool we do that. We haven't done that every year. We've been to Waitsville. We've yeah, been to like Faceton. Honestly, yeah, like with the with the, all the fifth and sixth graders. It'd be amazing. Yeah, and I they brainstormed like a question. We did the same thing. All right. Anyway.
You guys are wonderful. Don't hit oh the my table. god. Are you sure you have yeah, to graduate? Don't, don't hit the table. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> sure. yeah. Every time you did that, I was like, no. I was trying to be. Yeah, eight. there was there was a moment where my hand was like, don't <laughs> touch oh the table. <laughs> don't graduate. No, do graduate and come back. Okay, I leave in like six days. I, I leave in Olivia three days. Okay, I went to okay so here we go. Wet, Part two. And I, I, like, took off I, and I want to be sensitive oh, to your like, time. Um. You don't all have to do individual interviews, but I'm wondering if if you could go in twos, or you could go by yourself, or you could say no, thank you. You don't feel comfortable, but just one last kind of piece in front of the camera. What would you do? You have any parting words for any teachers who would be interested in? Um, adopting this pedagogy or learning or do you or do you have any words for students or do you have any last parting words about how you've grown and changed um, how this has affected your life any last thing that you would want to say um, so broad yeah it is I just I, I want I just I want you to just think do it I want you to think for a minute and I want yeah I want you to speak really um, from your heart that's why I'm opening this up is there any, especially you seniors, as you're leaving high school now, what you've learned about yourself, about teaching and learning, what are you going to take with you as you move on? That might be something you might respond to, or anything that you want to say. But this is about paying it forward right now, right? Everything that you've done today is a gift to me, but it's, we're, we're opening this up. It's about paying it forward. Is there any last thing that you'd want to share? Um, from your experience, I mean, this is personal. I mean, you can choose to say, you know, I I want to pass, and would you do that one at a time? How would you want to do that? Do you need if to be at the table? Wants to make a statement, just leave it. I'm not on Or roll. we could do it one on one, or we could just go around the table, or uh, table, table. Table. You could just stay here. <laughs> you just don't so. Want to I guess any last thing that you would offer up? Think before you speak mm. and listen to others. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm someone who um, is really doesn't like buzzwords, um, but going around is the whole growth mindset thing. And like I just had to preface with that because um, doing these discussions no matter how um, uncomfortable or frustrated I was, you know, I still had to finish them and sit through them. Mm -hmm. And I, <laughs> I really, really hope that that's something um, I take with me in my life where, you know, things are hard to think about and I, I don't want to deal with them. I hope that having done this um, will to help make that easier for me. Um, and that I never feel comfortable enough in my life to stop asking questions. Mm -hmm. And I also I hope that other people are able to have a similar experience. Thank you. Yep. As, a, as, a, uh, as, a, as a testament for how much um, I've appreciated Cry dialogue. Um, you know, for me, I've I've reached out, you know, to my philosophy professor next year, and I definitely plan on creating um, a chapter of Cry dialogue um, at my at my college. And um, as somebody who is aspiring to get into um, social service, public public policy, and that sort of thing, I I, I definitely see a a place for Cry dialogue necessity. That that dialogue is more accessible to people. Um, and so I'm excited to see where, how you know, New London is going to take, take this approach to, to conversing with one another. And um, so, I mean, I definitely believe it. It, it's still on my, it's lingering on my mind to, to the point where I do want to continue to uh, pay it forward. Something that may seem kind of counterproductive, but like a piece of wisdom I would like to offer to any teachers or students getting involved in this would just be to forget about you because I remember the first time mm -hmm. I facilitated 
It was just like, well, what if I stutter? What if I choke? What if I do this or that? What if I forget the question that I asked? That would be embarrassing, but. Sorry, um, that's definitely happened. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that the nature of the dialogue is so makes you very introspective anyway so it's really important to kind of try and forget about yourself and work towards the goal of the community of people of reaching deeper understanding so just trying to forget about you and just let yourself go in the moment i think part of what's so valuable about this for me is that um how we talked about how it kind of builds personal relationships between the people that you are doing the Socratic dialogue with. And especially just like what Olivia said and like learning from maybe like older people or just like anyone that you are having this dialogue with can really help you to change the way you can help other people. And for me, it's really hard because I can never find the right moment to put in my idea. So I'm just like, oh, no, it's too late now. And then I'll think of something, but then it never really will come out. So just like having people that are really confident and supportive, are, it's really great to have that kind of relationship. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to get your ideas in because everybody's waiting for the one person who's I talking you to finish. You can literally so see everyone. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, okay. They're just like ready to pounce. Like sprinting like. position. Yeah. Like, okay, yeah. Come, let's go. <laughs> let's do this. Oh, I think, okay, so my words of wisdom would have to be probably towards more pointed towards people who are still a little unsure any students or teachers um, about kind of adopting the style of learning um, is really with this for me is there's a much much larger goal in all of this I mean I'm still a junior in high school be a senior but for me and more th through learning this is I, I see way too, like way, way farther into my future with it. Um, it's something that needs to be brought about with change and you have to be willing to make that change. You have to go out there and really bring this upon yourself and bring it upon other people to kind of realize this moment of action and to really take it. Cause it's, I'm not doing this for me. I mean, I'm already going through high school, I'm going to be college, and that's going to be done soon enough. This change and what I'm doing now is for the future of my children, other kids, people in the future, the kids that will soon be running our country, and all around the world, everywhere else. And I feel like that's what Cole mentioned is a problem with a lot of philosophers, is we can sit here all day and talk about it at a table. But when it comes to taking action, that's probably one of the hardest things. And that's where we all need to make a kind of like a realization of let's let's take that action let's make this change let's do it and let's secure the future of our education and so that's kind of how i feel about it so um i guess i would just have to stay have to say um that i believe really firmly uh in uh, i guess being a very educated member of society. I was going to try and figure out how to, how to rephrase that, but it's important to be an educated member of society. In fact, I think it's crucial. I think if you are not an aware, educated member of society, you are not doing your civic duty. And I understand, I very much understand that there are so many boundaries and there are so many obstacles we have to get over and there are so many prejudices and there are so many limitations and we're going to be struggling with those for a very long time, but anybody can talk not anybody can talk. Sorry, that was definitely ableist. Most people can talk. Most people can listen. Uh, most people have the capacity to be respectful and have the capacity mm -hmm. to delve into these ideas. And I think anything is worth talking about if you go at it from the right way and if you go at it with respect and with that intention to get to the deepest level you possibly can with the concept. Uh, so I guess what I'm trying to say is I firmly believe that Socratic dialogue is a pillar of being mm -hmm. a functional member of society. So if you're not on board yet, just try it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Go team. Thank you. You're the greatest. I'll cry everyone. Kaya! I'll cry in class no. every time. Not again. So, guys, do this. Do me a favor. Especially...